So there's the seven steps to brief, briefing a Supreme Court case. And you'll notice, what have I got here? I've got the Weeks case um, that I asked you guys to read for class today. I put a picture up on one side, probably has some value to it. And I put our big seven questions up on the left-hand side. This is how we do it. I think that could be a song, couldn't it? It is, yeah, I know. I'm not that old. <laughs> not that old. Uh, I told my son that he had to drop it like it was hot this weekend, and he hit me. Um, yeah, I'm not a Snoop Dogg fan, but that, that phrase is just uh, apocryphal. I've got a picture of the International Mining and Investment Company, uh, some sheets there. Uh, half class, looks like they might be stocks, it might be something else. Anybody know what that comes from? Has anybody seen that before? What? That's the actual paperwork from the Weeks case. That's some of the paperwork that this, that's some of the papers that this dude was selling. So, what, who were the parties in this case? This is where you guys interact with me because I'm not going to tell you. You'll either tell me or you won't. Um, what was involved here? Who was, who was suing who or who was in court as the appellant um, and as the respondent and why? This is the part in class where eye contact never occurs. Yeah, what's your name, partner? Max. Max, all right, Max. Um, Mr. Uh, you from Indiana, man? Yeah. What part? Greenwood. Greenwood, I lived in South Bend for about seven years. I'm sorry. South Bend, Niles, you know. <laughs> uh, Indiana's a great place to be from. It's like Alabama. It's from yeah. Anyway. Um. <laughs> Uh, he's got a Brickyard 400 shirt on. It's not that he looks like he's from Indiana. It's just a shirt. A look, though. Oh, yeah, there is a look. It's usually pasty. Yeah. <laughs> the sun never shines in Indiana. If, you, if, you, if you've lived in Indiana, it's an inside joke, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're inside for roughly six months? Yeah, at least, at least six months out of the year, yeah. yeah. Uh. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Fremont Weeks was trying to get his um, items back from uh, the district, uh, not, uh, it was a federal marshal, mm -hmm. I said. Uh, and he was accused of uh, like selling mm -hmm. uh, lottery tickets. He was running some sort of scam, right? Yeah. Could anybody sort out what the scam was from the case? Or did it not seem clear? It wasn't clear. It was, okay. Lottery tickets and, and uh, yeah. stocks. Wasn't he using the mail for his like, uh, gambling scheme? Using the mail is how it became a federal case as opposed to uh, a state case. Let's try something really cool for a moment. Those of you who are on uh, your computers right now, type in uh, Weeks uh, VUS and see if you can find a website or websites where there's been some you know, Supreme Court nerd who has put together all the facts for the case. It's on case briefs. Well, oh, yes. Yeah, no, but the case briefs is not, um, I kind of put this the right way. <laughs> Several of those websites are designed to either sell you something or to point you in the direction of a particular company or product. Um, yes. Oyez, I use Oyez. Oh yeah, Oyez is not a bad one either, right? Yeah, that's it. I mean, I, I've, I've had good luck with that, but it says that it was a scam for um, transporting lottery tickets through the mail, basically. That's it's a scam. When you read these cases, if the facts are not there, go to Oyez, go to Case Brief, um, or go to Google. I don't care. But, but find the facts. Find some juicy piece of it that you can bring back in and share with the rest of us. So it looks like he's running some kind of lottery ticket scam. Are lottery ticket scams run by just anybody? Do you just, do you just set up your lottery ticket scam and you start selling tickets on the side? Is that how that works? Who is usually involved in illegal gambling besides the, the Trump organization? The mafia. The mafia, organized crime, organized crime. Uh, what type of cases, particularly in the 20s and the 30s, 
40s, 50s, and 60s, do we have in federal jurisdiction? Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking like bootlegging cases. Okay. Well, you had the bootlegging cases. Yeah, precluding recall. It's all organized crime or drug activity with a few rapes and murders and robberies thrown in. But a lot of this flows from organized crime, which means that in order to get jurisdiction, you got to have something like the use of the mail, or there's some factor that's not really germane to the case, but that they'll often talk about a lot because it established jurisdiction. It established jurisdiction from a criminal perspective. And it might be interesting for that reason. So we've got, uh, we've got some dude who is running, um, who's running numbers. Uh, my wife's grandmother used to play the state lottery and the mafia lottery in Erie, Pennsylvania. She preferred the mob's numbers, quite frankly, because the odds were better and they paid more. The odds were better and they paid more. If you're going to run an underground uh, gambling thing, you have to have a better payout and you have to pay out on time because otherwise people won't run the risk of, uh, of uh, engaging in criminal activity. What's one of the advantages of a lottery that's run by an organized crime institution? In the back. No taxes. I was watching her face and she, she made the... She made the face of someone who either knows somebody or who may herself at some point in time have played the numbers with the mob. As long as you don't get into debt to them, it's actually pretty good. Um, that's how they used to make their money, by the way, before they got into selling drugs. A lot of it was, uh, was running numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, he's running numbers. He gets, uh, he gets caught. What's the issue in the case? What's the, what's the question here? They went to his house without a warrant. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. They went inside his home without a warrant. Did they have a probable cause or any reason to believe stuff was there? What was the reason they went inside, Austin? Well, I mean, uh, ostensibly it was to see papers and such related to the lottery scam, but they also took a lot of unrelated personal effects, which is also part of his petition was to get things that were unrelated to evidence in the case return. So they grabbed a bunch of his stuff? Yeah. What was the issue, though? Why Why did this make it to the appellate level? Yeah, Kelly? I don't know if this is the issue or not, but didn't they arrest him without a warrant, too, and that made the search kind of sketchy? I in the back. The issue is whether um, <coughs> when they were searching his house, could be used at trial against him. So they found evidence in the house that they wanted to use against him at trial. They used it at trial, correct? Yeah. What's Weeks' argument as to why they should not have used that evidence at trial? Apparently it's his Fourth Amendment rights. What right in particular was he concerned with? You were right to know. It's a search and seizure. Okay, was he worried about the fact that they searched the home, uh, that the search was unreasonable, that they searched the home without a warrant, what was the particular thing that the cops did? Um, he was specifically concerned about the seizure of his property. He had petitioned to get it back, um, and the court granted part of it and then had denied part of it. Um, so he had renewed his objection at trial, and it was denied again. So we've got... A search issue we could have a seizure issue we could have a warrant issue we could have a reasonableness issue now I pull those out of the Fourth Amendment that we read in class last week right and we talked at length about reasonableness versus unreasonableness the need for warrant when do we not need a warrant so now we've got this first case is it one of these, or is it something else that Mr. Weeks is concerned with from a Fourth Amendment perspective? And let's find it in the case. You know, where where is this happening? That that this is his issue. Yeah. He petitions to get the items back. So he petitions for his items back. When he petitions petitions for the items back, what is the reason that he provides that they should be given to him? That they were never supposed to be taken in the first place. Can you show us where in the in the in the 
in the book you're looking. What page are we on? Um, I don't know where it is. Take your time. Yeah, yes. Um, well, this is where they were citing a different case, but they were saying that it wasn't the fact that they broke in and rummaged his doors, but the invasion of his um, right of personal security. What page is that? Um, the bottom of page five. Page, uh, the bottom of page five. Uh, invasion of right of personal security. Personal security sounds a little bit to me like the rights of the people to be secure in their persons, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizure or a warrantless search or, or a warrant that's bad. Yeah. Um, the page that has his uh, original petition was page three to page four. Mm -hmm. um, and then his renewed objection was I think two or three paragraphs under that. <clears throat> so is this case about him getting his property back? Is this case about the way the government got the property to begin with? Or is it about the way the government got the property and how they used the property to convict him at trial? Or is it about something else? Okay, now I'm going to stop. Everybody, everybody look at me for a minute. Does this seem remarkably similar to reading all those stupid examples about my daughter and trying to posit what the heck the rule is, right? And you feel a little bit like I'm not sure what the court is trying to do. Now, part of that is because this case is so old that it's not written in the way that cases are written today, at least by courts that are trying to be clear, right? We're trying to find, it's like an Easter egg hunt. We're, we're reading with specificity for the particular piece of language. And there's a couple of ways that you can do this analytically over the course of this semester. One way is to go to Legal Lines, Case Brief, OEA, uh, Bloomberg, and just find the black letter law for what the case stands for. I give you the black letter law at the end of every single case in the book. You don't need to worry about what the case stands for. But you need to be able to find where in the language of the case the black letter law connects. You know, so you know that really bright law student who wrote that synopsis for Lexus and got paid X amount of dollars for doing so, where the heck did they find it? Where did they find it? Because you need to be able to find it and you need to be able to see how that language in the case at this page creates this black letter rule. Because then you know which set of circumstances in the case the courts found most important. Because looking at it right now, I'm not sure where we are. Is this search and seizure? Uh, is this some violation of a property right? What was going on? And why did the court decide the case the way in which they did? You know, what, what is the court trying to say to us in Weeks v. U.S. What are they saying? Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to tell how I feel about it. I don't know. I don't know what's going on right now. Cool. Wait a But um, from what I got from the case, it was not necessarily that you searched my place, that you took the stuff, that you didn't have a warrant. Um, from what I read in the case, those things, while important, Fourth Amendment does say that, but these things are really important. The issue is that you're now not giving it back and you're going to use it against me as evidence. That's what I got from you. So the issue is not how you got it, where it came from, it's. The issue is now that you're going to use it against me to lock me up. It's the use. Yes. So it's the use of evidence that was. obtained in violation of a constitutional, in this case, a Fourth Amendment right. Can you use evidence that the government got in violation of your constitutional right? Prior to weeks, could you use evidence that the government got in violation of your constitutional right? Yeah. Now this is a federal court, right? What was the remedy before weeks? 
if your evidence was seized illegally, what were you supposed to do? Boom. Sue for trespass. Sue for trespass in what? In state court? I guess so. Who would you sue? Uh, district attorney. Uh, Law enforcement, whoever ordered the seizure? Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. When was Weeks decided? 1914. How long has the United States been in existence at that point in time? Well over 100 years, right? Well over 100 years. So for the first hundred and some odd years of our country's jurisprudence, if they came into your home and violated your property right and your person's papers, places, or effects, the solution, the remedy, was to sue for trespass and get monetary damages against the government. It was not to exclude the evidence. What does the Weeks case do? It excludes the evidence. This is like the font of all of criminal jurisprudence in the 20th and the 21st century. This is a rule that says if the government breaks your constitutional right, if they violate your rights, the remedy is to exclude that evidence at trial. Evidence that we know proves your guilt. Well, think about that for a moment. It is evidence that we know proves your guilt. So we have a guilty person. The government found evidence either on them or in their home in violation of the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, or the Sixth Amendment. Usually the Fourth, particularly in this case. They think the evidence might be there. They don't have probable cause. Um, they don't really know, but hey, he looks like the kind of person who might have this sort of evidence. He wears a turban, or he has an afro, or he... Uh, speaks with an accent, whatever. So we're going to take it. You guys sort of take as a as a as a fundamental grounding point that we should exclude evidence that's seized illegally. I would be interested to know whether or not you really believe that. Is there anybody here who thinks that the exclusionary rule is not the right solution? for violations of constitutional rights. It's gonna happen for me, but. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like you, absolutely there needs to be a remedy. Like, absolutely, there needs to be a remedy for it because you can't be going around violating people's constitutional rights. That's ridiculous. But if you have some kind of like concrete proof that yes, this person is absolutely guilty of this crime, but the evidence was obtained illegally, like there's gotta be a better way to have a person who did commit it suffer the consequences of their actions and also have the person who legally obtained the evidence suffer as well. Like, I feel like there's a better balance. So you'd like to punish the person who violated the constitutional right, but not reward the person yeah, exactly. whose right was violated. John? That's such a slippery slope. We can't be like, well, listen, I know we violated your right, but we know for a fact that you did this. So That's what we did for over 100 years. That don't make it right. Which brings us back to what I know that don't make it right. So which brings us back now. People are released from life imprisonment on death row every day five minutes since next year, which are people we thought we knew for a fact we're guilty. So we know we don't get it right all the time. And, our, and our, what we're saying is, you know what? You may not get this right, but for the most part, we think you might be guilty. So we're going to violate your rights and do what we want to. But if we're, if we're working from a, from a jurisprudential standpoint or a philosophical standpoint of the needs of society. It's better for our, a guilty person to go free than for us to, to, get, to violate these rights. So is your value system oriented on the person and not the society? Do you really think that the rights of one person are more important than the collective need of society? So that one person represent that society because next time it can be your rights. And they're saying, listen, today is, it's easy to say, well, it's that guy, but when it's you, you want your rights to be respected. Yeah, I, I, you see, you're not answering my question because you don't like the question. You don't want to say that you actually think that the rights of the individual are more important than the collective right of society. You want to connect them and say that you can't have one without the other. Right. Okay. I, I mean, I, I'll accept that position for now. I will posit that by the end of the semester you will not be there. Awesome.
I'd, I'd go the other way and say that the way that our society is built right now, the exclusionary rule got even more important. You know, prior and at the time of weeks, it was going into your home and maybe your place of business. Nowadays, for all you know, I could have multiple felonies worth of evidence on this right here. Oh yeah, you don't easily. Have to, you don't have to find me in my house or anything. You can stop me on the street, and this is all you need, right here. Do I you know that? More important. A, a year ago, two years ago, we did not know whether or not you had a right to privacy the digital information that was contained within your phone. I mean, just a year or so ago, there was an argument that um, that the cops could go through it just like they go through your wallet or your purse when they arrested you and look at anything that was in it. Uh, now we think that that's not the case. We'll read we'll read the 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 case out of California that actually we think has has decided it. But although we may learn when we read it that there are all sorts of ways around it, we'll have to we'll have to think through that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> when you're um, you know, released uh, from like <coughs> on death row than than and you're just released to an, an innocence initiative like that. Uh, you also have the right to sue for you know time. Yeah, you do. Lost. Why? Why do we still have that and not just incorporate that back into the evidence at that point? Isn't it worse to you know spend someone for a long period of time or just pay money for it rather than a small. Well, if you think about it for a moment, if, if I run a city or a state um, and, uh, and I am the person who's going to have to pay the bill every time law enforcement violates a constitutional right, you could make an argument that there would be more effective training of law enforcement if it cost money out of the state budget than if uh, some person goes free. I could walk down that argument line and say what we ought to do is both. We ought to exclude the evidence. We ought to sue the people who violated the constitutional right. Uh, and not only should they not go to jail, but they should get money for having had their constitutional right violated. If the goal is to protect both the individual and society, that might work. Yeah, Kelly and then and back. Aren't we Whose name? That? I cannot remember your name. I want to say Ali. JD. I know. <laughs> JD. Hang, hang on just a second. JD is. A, I'm trying to come up with a mnemonic that'll make it stick in my head. All right, Kelly and then JD. Aren't we doing that with 1983 though? So couldn't this guy have like sued under 1983 as well? And well, 1983 didn't exist then. Oh, it didn't. Okay. No, this is 1914. <laughs> okay. And, no, and 1983. Yeah, in 1983, 1914, um, you're about 70 years in the future. But also, 1983 is a very narrow statute, right? It's only dealing with certain things. My daughter's got a 1983 case right now uh, up in Missouri uh, that she's uh, having a lot of fun with. So it's an interesting statute, but that's a statutorily carved exception, right? It's not a constitutional exception. And this case took a particular path. The path being the exclusion of evidence that we know proves guilt. We don't apply the exclusionary rule in cases where the person was not convicted. Now we might apply the exclusionary rule at the trial level now and present it, but every single Fourth Amendment case that we read this semester is a Fourth Amendment case of a person who was either guilty of something or who was made to appear guilty by law enforcement through their actions. Because the thing that we haven't talked about yet is that all of this presumes that law enforcement is acting honorably and honestly. Of course, you can't trust either the police or prosecutors because they all go native after a while and lose their way. Or they quit and do something else. Because what happens is... Um, if you try criminal cases all the time, psychologically, everyone becomes a criminal. Uh, at the end of my third year as a senior defense counsel at Fort Benning, Georgia, I knew that all of you were committing sexual offenses against your children and your spouses. Uh, I had no doubts in my mind that everyone was raping everybody because every case I dealt with, every case I dealt with was sexual assault. Why am I pointing that out? Because the pressure of the environment within which you live over time impacts the way in which you view 
the facts. You can't keep your filters clean. You cannot remain neutral. You, you become associated with the values of the institution that you are a part of. And over time as a prosecutor, most prosecutors at some point think everyone is guilty of something. And it's just finding the thing that they're guilty of. And if I look long enough and hard enough, I will find it. I never had a, a case as a prosecutor that didn't end in a guilty plea for something. You know, if, if I thought that you'd committed rape, and as part of your defense to the rape, you had confessed to consensual sodomy, in my jurisdiction, consensual sodomy was a, was a crime. So I would charge you with sodomy and with the rape, and then let you take the stand to try to explain how it wasn't non-consensual because I engaged in sodomy. And then I would say, Your Honor, he's just confessed by operation of law he should be convicted of the crime of sodomy, out of the words of the defendant's mouth. And we didn't have jury nullification in that jurisdiction. So I could always convict somebody of something if I wanted to as a prosecutor. I could always get someone indicted if I want to as law enforcement. They have phenomenal power, right? If We have to presume that the police are being honest at a certain level for this work. And it may be that the exclusionary rule is like, hey guys, you have to stay within the lanes. And if you don't, we're not going to let you get away with it. <coughs> we all assume that it's a valid rule as a matter of course now. But actually, when this happened, it was revolutionary. And there are still people who are very much convinced that the exclusionary rule is not the best solution for evidence uh, that is seized in violation of constitutional right. I don't know. What's fascinating is that Weeks was in 1914. When was the MAP decision decided, guys? 1684. Say again? 61. So from 1914 on, the exclusionary rule was the solution in federal court if you violated my constitutional rights. I could get the evidence against me excluded. You could proceed with admissible evidence. Maybe you got the conviction, maybe you didn't. But for 50, what, 54, 57 years, in state court, you could still use evidence that was seized in violation of my constitutional rights. I, guess, I never understood why like, the courts would always make a rule just for federal courts. Knowing the majority of people come from state courts, it was like they were trying to change stuff, but not too much. Because they did the same thing, they did the same thing, they were the same thing with the right time to return. If you were in federal court, you haven't got a federal public defender. But if you were in state court, up until uh, the case that gave you a public defender, you didn't have one. So, like, what? Like, why was it always going to only count for federal, but never for state, until another case subsequently, sometimes 50 years later, tells you, you know what, a lot of states as well? Well, it's the nature of the political argument that we've engaged in in the United States from a Federalist perspective. It goes all the way back to the Federalist Papers, to the fight between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson over the idea of a centralized form of federal government or the power of individual states uh, to be left alone by the federal government and live in, in the way in which they wanted to. This push me, pull you has had a lot of unintended consequences from the standpoint of constitutional law development. And every bit of it at some level has been tied to um, sociological and economic decisions that hurt individual states, but might have been very good for the psyche of the nation of a whole. I mean, the one that's easiest to look at uh, is slavery. But you can make the same argument on desegregation, you can make the same argument on every hot topic issue where the federal government has pushed the states in a particular direction. You could also make an argument that our current president of the United States is actually a visceral, a visceral gut check, kick you in the um, abdomen emotional response by a lot of people in a lot of states who feel like the federal government's got no business telling them how to live. Uh, it's, it's fascinating if you were a, how many of you were poli-sci majors in undergrad? Yeah, quite a few of us. I was a poli sci English major. I mean, there's a structure here that's way underneath the surface. Yeah. Well, isn't, isn't a, a shorter answer than on that just to go look at the first case? 
because he, he didn't just flee on, on we just didn't just flee on the Fifth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, he put on the Missouri Constitution. Yeah, he did. So the law, most of these states, by the time they're getting around to the 60s with, with uh, integrating the, the Federal Bill of Rights, already had these protections, at least at the time of, in, in 1914. Um, and these cases need to be seen as, uh, at least the immigration ones, seen as, as a, um, you know, the, the federal government bestowing all these horrible states, <coughs> don't do this. Because that's definitely the, the opinion of these. Um, you would make the argument that factually the states had actually stepped out in front of the federal government, at least having the yeah. laws on the books. Yeah, this is clean up. This is, a, this is Ohio just not getting it together until now. So, um, and a few other times. Well, what you, what you actually have um, is a lot of movement forward by some jurisdictions and no movement forward by others. I mean, the state that we reside in now, Florida, is actually, from an individual rights perspective, one of the most progressive states in the nation, historically. I know that sounds odd to say, because most folks view us as a, a supremely conservative state, um, and, and the Republicans, at least for the last 10 years or so, have pretty much had a, a, a complete control of the state house and the state legislature. But yet, hand in hand with that is very much a, um, a commitment to individual rights, much of it grounded in the state constitution. And those concepts in the state constitution flowed out of what was in the federal constitution and then the states adopting it and making it part of their culture. But it hasn't been even across the board, even remotely. Not even remotely has it been even across the board. And what we don't talk about in the United States a lot is that the rights that you have in one jurisdiction can be fundamentally different from the rights that you have in another jurisdiction. Uh, depending upon what group you might find yourself in that's subject to discrimination. And different groups are discriminated against in different ways. So the federal government creates the baseline, but they don't actually build the legal house that most of us live in. And that's very much left up to the states. Not like that in almost any other civilized society in, in Western democracy. Uh, and it's either a great strength of our, of our nation or a really difficult problem. If you believe in centralized control and that everybody ought to be the same, then you think that it's a real problem. If you think that individual expression and cultural um, the cultural rights of a society within certain parameters should be allowed to continue, you think it's a great strength of the nation. What's really interesting is that where you come down on that issue is not always driven by race or, um, or sexual orientation or gender. Uh, it might be driven by the cultural values that you received from your family growing up that don't have anything to do uh, with uh, the color of your skin or who you like to sleep with. It's something else that you were taught. It's fascinating because we split in ways that we don't always understand. If we go back and look at the facts in weeks, arrested by federal authorities at his place of work without a warrant. They search his home without a warrant because the neighbors told them where the key was. Then they did a second warrantless search of his apartment um, later in the day. Uh, and the magistrate did this looking for more evidence of illegal gambling. So when I think about questions to ask in a Fourth Amendment case, as I'm sorting through the application of the law, who conducted the search, what were they looking for, what level of suspicion, probable cause, uh, belief did they have, you know, the reason that they wanted to search, and then I look to see whether or not they had a warrant. These four questions can help me begin to sort out what direction I think the case is going to flow in, right? That can be helpful to me. Um, let's talk about Matt v. Ohio. Uh, this is Miss Matt. She passed away recently. Um, that's her mugshot from Cleveland, 1957. Did anybody catch the most interesting fact in this entire case? At least for me. What do you guys think was the most interesting fact in the case? Austin? Uh, I thought like the uh, implicit statement that she was some kind of communist or other dissenter based on, was it a policy paraphernalia, what's the phrasing? I, I mean, it's, 
I couldn't figure out the first four or five years that I read this case. Was she a madam? Was she a prostitute? Was she running drugs? Was she involved in civil rights? What the heck was this woman doing that all these people are so up in her business? You know, what was going on? They're looking for suspects in a bombing in her case. She refused. They watched the house. They didn't enter it without her permission, over the objections of her lawyer and without a warrant. In the hallway, she asked to see the warrant. And they show her a piece of paper. She grabs it and stuffs it down her shirt. I mean, we've got, we don't have lawyers on the phone. We've got them in the house. A struggle ensued. I bet it did. She was subdued and handcuffed. Her clothes, suitcase, and other areas of the house were searched, and the obscene materials were discovered. Riddle me this, Batman. What were the obscene materials? What? Was it porn? Was it, uh, was it handouts for racial equality? In violation of some Ohio law? What 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 did Miss Map have in this house that was obscene? And what does the word obscene even mean? You know it when you see it. Yeah, well, it's like saying beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What did Miss Map have that caused them to treat her this way? Did anybody wonder or see or find it anywhere? At trial, no warrant was produced and no explanation for the lack of the warrant um, was provided. Here's the, here's the back story in this case. On May 23rd, a bombing occurred at the home of Don King, a notorious policy racketeer who later became a famous boxing promoter. Don King, he endorsed President Trump. African-American dude, the hair standing straight up. Deeply involved with Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali, famous or an infamous guy. What is <coughs> policy racketeer? Were they selling illegal insurance? Was it a pyramid scheme? Yeah. Uh, California gold betting slips. California gold betting slips. And what's that? I'm still looking because I don't know. I was going yeah. to explain what that meant. <laughs> Some kind of lottery thing, it sounds like, it's a betting thing. Was, was this uh, an illegal oh. black betting? What, what? I was going to say, also, there was pornography. There were pornographic books. So that's what these two materials were. I don't know what kind of pornography, but I guess pretty girls. So. I have never been able to find the porn. I have searched everywhere. Because <laughs> I'm just wondering what was the pornography that was obscene, right? Because they make a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. I, I no more think that they were after her because she had skin mags than a man in the moon. That's just, it was there, it was salacious in the 1950s, it could be embarrassing to the person who was charged, causing to question her moral fiber. You know, so there's something going on there, right? Um, Cleveland police received an anonymous phone tip that Virgil Ogletree was at the home of Dollree Mapp. The Cleveland Bureau of Special Investigation. You read this and you think it comes out of Alabama or Georgia or Mississippi, and we're in Ohio. Y'all know where the home of the KKK is? The single largest per capita membership of the Ku Klux Klan from about the 1920s on? Indiana. Makes sense. Indiana. <laughs> Same place where the John Birch Society comes from, but as a matter of fact. Um, and if you don't know what that is, uh, I'm not going to tell you, but it's, it's pretty creepy. So, they get at the scene. She asked for the warrant. They lock her up. It was not a warrant that they showed her. And at no time during the search did they have a warrant. They found Ogletree in the basement apartment, who's who they were looking for, right? They wanted the guy who was a suspect in the bombing. 
They find Ogletree in the apartment, an unloaded gun, some policy paraphernalia, I think that means the numbers that they were selling, and four obscene books and several obscene sketches. No sketches. <laughs> How obscene can a sketch? I mean, have you seen Titanic? In, 19, in the 1950s, a sketch could be obscene. A stick figure could be obscene, guys. I mean, y'all don't, y'all have been desensitized by the internet. You know, obscenity at this point in time has to involve interspecies activity for it to even rise to the level of potential obscenity. You know, just so, not too long ago, you had to buy your porn at the store. Now you just click. Uh, it's made for a different world, good or bad, I don't know, but it's, it's definitely a different world. So who was conducting the search? The Office of Special Legations for Cleveland. What were they looking for? They were looking for Ogletree. That's what they were looking for. Anything else they found was just an opportunity to tune up Ms. Mapp. Why? Because she was difficult. If Ms. Mapp had left them in the door, do you think she would have been charged with anything? No. Probably not. But because she did not want to let the police to come into her home without a valid warrant, she winds up a convicted felon. Because she said, no, you can't come into my house unless a judge has said that you can. And she paid for that. Did they have suspicion? They had an anonymous tip that Ogletree was in the basement, or was in the house. Do you guys feel comfortable that a phone call from an unidentified source or a note or a conversation in a bar should be sufficient to allow law enforcement to intrude into the personal space of an American citizen? I mean, sometimes people are in a situation where they're afraid to let their name be known to give a tip. Like, hi, I am X, and I'm in this criminal organization, and I'm living on everyone in here. Like, I would get why you would feel comfortable maybe only giving a tip anonymously. Well, I could see why people would be comfortable only being anonymous. Yeah, and if that's all you have to go on it, and it's a big deal, I mean, shouldn't law enforcement be allowed to pursue something like that? I don't know. That's the question. Should they, or should we require something more? John? I need a tip plus more. You, wh why do you need more? I don't like John Kimbrough. I'm going to call the cops and say, the dude's got weed. Exactly. He's growing marijuana in his backyard. Then I'm messing around and actually got some weed in my backyard. Now. But then, then you're guilty. And we're all happy. It's not about me being guilty. <laughs> it's about the fact that you rely on everything you rely on. Obviously. The anonymous tip was valid. The stuff was there. That's like, Until it's not. That's the thing. Until, if it's not, that's, the that's my Until thing. It's if it's, it's not, not valid, then there's no. There's if it's not there, there's no crime. You won't be arrested. Exactly. You just had a little bit of time with the police. Well, you kick my door in and you go through all my stuff and don't put it back. Now I'm just inconvenienced and it's like, oh, but at least, at least you didn't do nothing. Well, you're inconvenienced, but you're safe. I mean, I feel like it's and a that's, catastrophe. And that's the problem. problem. My problem is if they don't find weed, they find something totally different. And then, and then at that point, yeah. Well, you shouldn't have had that other thing. What? Was she burning at one? <laughs> what? It's a little bit of so, uh, <laughs> It's not like it was a lot of porn. Exactly. She had a couple books. Like, she had one Victoria's Secret magazine, now she in jail. They didn't have Victoria's Secret in 1957, <laughs> but okay. It's Frederick's of Hollywood back then, my friend. <laughs> I think personally it's beyond, you know, being inconvenienced or whether or not I'm guilty. It's beyond that. If I am innocent, say I, say I am innocent, you have now invaded my space. You have, you know. <laughs> what damages have you had from that, though? That, I mean, really. But that damage is enough for me. You, you have violated not only my personal space, but my home. I no longer feel safe because you can bust in whenever you want. You know, I got into a, into a fight with my neighbor. She hates me. And now the police are called. Like, yep, she got some cocaine. Like, every other day, the police are coming and knocking down my door because they think I have some kind of drug. Y'all are doing this whenever y'all want. Like, I have no say in it at all. It's just whenever you get this anonymous tip. See, That's not enough. She, she anonymous is not enough for you. You want something more. John wants something more. Kelly? I understand what Keangela is saying because if the cops roll up at your house, all the neighbors are going to know. Like, our neighbors talk about everything. If the cops came to our house and knocked on our door, even if we'd done nothing, 
<clears throat> they demanded to come in. Everybody would, like in the neighborhood, we would think. We had a law professor who was working here well over 10 years ago, and the cop showed up at his house one night. You don't think every member of this faculty has talked about that for the next 10 years? Oh, I'm sure they have. Yeah, that's absolutely. That, that's, yeah. That's, that's human nature. That's human yeah. nature. I mean, you can't do drugs to say drug, or it's like bomb or something like that. You don't want an anonymous tip. You take that up, you know, because you want that security for everybody. So you think there's a sliding scale here. For some things, the anonymous tip should be enough. I mean, that's, I do, I, I hate saying I do. Have you looked in a mirror lately? Have I looked at what? In a mirror. Absolutely, I get this shit all the time. You get, so you get this shit all the time, right? Absolutely. So why would you? But even you, even you feel that way. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather okay, be safe. Okay, why? I'd rather be safe, known. I'd rather be in a safer environment than, than not. But I do feel with John's point that. So safety for you is a value that is of such importance absolutely. that you think of the loss of some constitutional protections is yeah, worthwhile. I walk through TSA and I go ahead and show them this. You know. Yeah. So, know so you just accept the pat yeah, down. Do. You don't want to argue about it, okay, D'Angelo? Keangelo. Keangelo, I'm sorry. Oh. God. <laughs> Bless America. <laughs> um, Just correct me until I get it right, okay? Okay, no problem. While I understand the point of safety, I would have an issue. What if I hated you? I just dislike you. Right. I'm calling on you every day. He has it. I know he has it. You guys missed it. Go back to his basement this time. Nope. Next week is in his attic. Next week, I'm calling on you all the time. Just or you have your friends call. At that point, that's, well, that's, that's, that's illegal on your part, though, because it's like making false accusations. Well, I'm anonymous. You're not actually anonymous. Yeah, you're not anonymous. You're not actually anonymous. Way too deep into this. I mean, no, the point, the point is... All right, okay, guys, let's stop it here for today. We'll pick up...